you know, if we don't fix the planet, we don't care about that, it doesn't matter, or you think it's a hoax, it's still one of the biggest business opportunities in the history of humanity. Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing innovators in the creative, social impact, and earth conservation spaces. I also bring you ideas and techniques that you can grab and use to set goals, create, and unlock your potential for changing yourself and the world. And now let's get to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Super honored that you're taking the time to be here. I'm also really, really honored and thrilled to have this week's guest on the show. Check out Bill Nussi. Bill is a career tech CEO with multiple exits, including an IPO. What does that mean? I'm gonna ask him. He worked at Greylock as a venture capitalist and after selling his marketing tech company, Silverpop to IBM, he shifted roles to help lead IBM's global strategy for their CEO and SVPs. He spent the last few years creating media ventures in climate tech. You know, that's catnip to me, so I'm excited to talk about this. He started with a TED Talk, which grew into the number one ranked podcast in renewable energy. His new book, Freeing Energy, which I've read and is awesome, is a practical guide for disrupting and democratizing energy. Bill, thank you so much for taking the time. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. That's a great introduction. I'm flattered and uh, really excited to chat with you. This is so, I, first of all, as I said, anything having to do with addressing issues such as climate change and providing energy in a safe and responsible way is catnip to me. It's very, very important to me. But before we get there, I always like to start these kinds of things because this is the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I want to talk to you a little bit about what got you here, what got you from where you were to now working on something that to me is the biggest issue of our times, which is which is addressing climate change and providing renewable, responsible energy. Well, I, I had this, the, I had this amazing moment um, that I will never forget that uh, we had just announced we had sold my company silver pop to IBM. And I stepped out of the all the meetings and the interviews of the Wall Street Journal and all this and I went into a conference room and I just sat there and said to myself, Bill, soak this in, remember this, take a snapshot because building businesses is really hard and it's often painful. And I said, remember how exciting it can be to, to have that glory moment. And as I sat there, I had this transition from, holy cow, how cool is this to this incredible, overwhelming sense of obligation. I started thinking about all of these people that had that didn't didn't have the financial and network and other resources that I developed over my career, and yet they were devoting their entire lives uh, doing things that were so much more important than themselves. And I thought, if these people, and I'd met many, were willing to put so much of their own lives towards these bigger causes, how could I possibly do less? And that really started a journey for me to look for. There were three things that I wanted to incorporate into the next chapter of my career. And, uh, you know, the first was I wanted to really make, make a difference in the long-term world, particularly around the future of the planet. Two, I wanted to uh, do things that would lift the lives of people who were a lot less fortunate, particularly the much, much less fortunate in some of the poor parts of the world. And then finally, I wanted to do those things within the context of a business opportunity that was disruptive uh, and it was going to change the business world too. And that set me off on a journey that ultimately led to clean energy as doing all of those three massive things at the same time. I love that. I love that you're approaching it from from sort of this idealistic standpoint, but also from a very, very practical one. And when people are of those two minds and approaching this these big issues like clean energy, renewable energy, climate change, you know, what are we doing to the planet, all of that. I think you need to have both the idealistic part of you and the realistic, pragmatic part of you. So let me ask you, when you're talking about this, all of this, all of these issues, all of these topics, at the at the sort of root of them is our future. And to me, the future, the biggest issue we're facing in the future, of course, is climate change. But I would love it if you could tell me what is in your in your view, in your mind, what is climate change? 
Well, you know, I don't even use the term climate change in freeing energy. Uh, okay. We don't talk about it in my podcast. We don't talk about it in the book because, well, it's a shrinking number of people. There's a very large number of people that that is a, a, a trigger phrase. It, mm. it, as soon as they hear it, they immediately mm-hmm. uh, start thinking about uh, that this is some kind of uh, attempt to persuade them that it isn't in their best interest. Now, of course, I know better than that. You know better than that, but an awful lot of people. So what I was really trying to do with the book was bring something that was truly universal, regardless of your preconceptions or your political affiliations, uh, which was, uh, hey, this is a way to create independence and, and to cr- save money or to create create v- uh, value if you're an entrepreneur. Uh, but I think that overall climate change really uh, is an appropriate term. You know, it used to be global warming and it got changed to to climate change through lots of both nefarious and well-intentioned actions. But climate change means that this thing that's been relatively stable for thousands of years, uh, that, you know, the weather, uh, temperatures, uh, availability of fresh water, these things are becoming increasingly unstable. And on paper, it doesn't seem super scary. Uh, And when I started writing the book five years ago, uh, there really wasn't any immediate evidence that this was happening. And what's happened, as we all know, is that uh, in the last two years, uh, everyday person in the U.S. and certainly outside the U.S. are starting to f- feel the see for their own their own two eyes. Is a huge uh, change starting to happen, and it's getting harder and harder to say, well, this would have happened if humans hadn't put all the carbon dioxide in the air. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to say that. This is just a natural cycle because, you know, when you've had your second or third 1,000 year flood or your second or third 1,000 year drought in four years, um, the average person starts to say, well, maybe there's something to this climate change. Yeah, it, it's so interesting to me. I love the, I love the way you said that. And I love what you said, because it is this it's a mindset mindset shift. And yes, this is the Innovative Mindset podcast, blah, blah, blah. But but there is this <laughs> shift that's happening that is so critical for us to note and yet until we see evidence until we see it for ourselves we don't think about it because climate is a long-term thing the health of the planet in many ways is a long-term thing so what you're talking about like the thousand year drought or the thousand year hurricane or whatever whatever it is whatever event happens we see those as spikes but we don't necessarily pay attention to the pattern the long-term trend and so with freeing energy to me in reading it i was looking at the ways that you were talking about things that were different right so you you mentioned something in the book a lot that i loved and it was you you talked about local energy and i'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that because that's something that takes the big global thing and brings it very much to the everyday person to the everyday community and it's smaller in scale can you talk a little bit about what is local energy and how that can benefit all of the different areas of the world that could benefit from it. When I first started researching the book, I was coming at it like most people do, which is this is a a global problem, a problem that governments need to be involved in to resolve, that large corporations need to be doing different things to resolve. And the further I got into my research, the more I realized that that was the the framework in which most people were considering addressing climate change. I, I got pretty despondent. Because I'm a startup person, I'm a, you know, I've built and grown lots of startups, and I was thinking I don't want to spend the rest of my career, you know, marching in front of, uh, uh, you know, f- uh, state houses. Uh, God bless the people that do it, um, but that wasn't necessarily what I was called to do, and um, and so in my desperation, I, I said, well, I started to think maybe this was a mistake. I said, there's got to be something entrepreneurs, something that innovators, that families, that individuals can do without just waiting on the federal government. Uh, U.S. and other countries to to fix it all for us with mm-hmm. their magic government wands, and uh, that's when I st- kind of for- forced my way into the notion that if you think about energy systems in a different framework, you think about them rather than these large institutional government run things, and you bring it down to the level of people, families, homes, buildings, schools, churches. That it occurred to me and became increasingly clear and then increasingly exciting that this is an entirely different market than anything anyone's been talking about. Mm. It, 
from if you're coming at this from a climate change is a problem, you're just as happy to see a giant solar field or wind uh, offshore wind farm uh, or a solar on the roof of uh, your neighbor as you are anything. It doesn't matter because it's all just in the in the, the towards the goal of reducing uh, the impact of climate change. <clears throat> But from a business point of view, which is really where I tried to take the conversation with, with free energy, uh, it's an entirely different market. And when, as I explored that market, I realized that it's in its earliest beginnings, it's going to absolutely be massive. And when I got really excited as old, and I knew I had to do this with my career, is I realized it was actually going to disrupt you know, sort of internet disrupting media, uh, PCs disrupting mainframes. It was going to disrupt this, what is arguably the largest industry in the planet Earth, which is traditional energy, electric power, hydrocarbons, oil and gas, it was going to, the small scale system was going to disrupt this in the same way that personal computers disrupted mainframes. And that's exactly where we're at. So if you could have gone back in 1970 and said, there's going to be this thing called personal computers, and they're going to be huge. And you could have made some bets. Imagine <laughs> uh, how much money you would have made. And that's exactly what my book's trying to do. Hey, if you think the personal computers took over mainframes and it changed the world, wouldn't you have liked to known that ahead of time? Well, this is my rally cry that this is the same thing happening uh, in the same way. Uh, and it's very early on and everybody should see it because it's a great business opportunity. And uh, we might just make the world a better place in the next 10 or 20 years. I would certainly hope so from from your from your mouth, right? I, the thing, you know, to me, the notion of an, it, when Apple went public, for example, it, or or even the 128K came out in 1984, we can go, oh, buy Apple computers now. Yeah, you should have bought Apple stock. But, you know, so few people didn't. And so we are in a position where some people who actually did see that trend going that way and did something about it won big. And people who yes. didn't might be sort of, you know, smacking their own foreheads. So talk to me, if you would, in this, this is this to me seems to be like like it's a, a tug of war for public opinion. Right. Like we were talking about earlier, as far as saying the words climate change, it's triggering for people. So when we're talking about this new way, this this sort of local energy way of of doing things, how do you, Bill Nussi, change public opinion how do you do that so that people start looking at this as an opportunity both to address some of these issues that we're facing on a planetary scale but also that it is a good a really good and innovative business opportunity you know there's a cartoon that i wish i could have licensed for my book and it's got a bunch of people at a, a climate conference and one of the people is clearly a skeptic about climate and he asks the question in the cartoon what if this entire climate thing is a hoax and we end up making a ton of money and inventing some things, inventing some fantastic inventions and it was all for nothing. And the, the, the beauty of the beauty of this is that, um, uh, that we really don't need to change people's opinion about climate change. We just have to change what we're talking about. And, and 20 years ago, five years ago, uh, if you wanted to save the future from runaway greenhouse gases, you had to basically go to someone and say, you're going to have to make some painful trade-offs. You're going to have to pay more money. You're going to have to change your lifestyle. And, and maybe you don't want to do those things. And uh, uh, and the politicians got involved, good Lord, and uh, said, oh, this is a political issue now too. And uh, so then all of a sudden, even contemplating doing those changes, uh, you could be um, uh, you know, leaving your tribe's uh, point of view as to how you should live your life. You could be, you know, you could be a trader. And so I think it just got crazy. And that's probably one of their big, that was one of the big reasons I wanted to write the book because, um, you know, if we don't fix the planet, uh, we don't care about that. It doesn't matter. Or you think it's a hoax. It's still one of the biggest business opportunities in the history of humanity. And that's what I try to focus on. And it's not just a business opportunity is government makes sweeping laws changes and you can get, change your tax equity point tax equity play by 50 basis points this is actually where entrepreneurs garages families communities schools universities can have the same kind of inventive uh disruptive thinking that birthed silicon valley that birthed the internet we can do that here we are doing that here uh for energy it's the first time in history 
whatever kind of energy it ever was, this is the first time in history where energy is not the sole province of the biggest, most powerful corporations and the governments that they uh, they dance with. This is the first time where energy can be personal, it can be community, uh, it can be something that people control. And that's going to be so exciting. And the book is really trying to get the point out there that, hey, climate change is critical, but that's not the conversation today. I'm taking a second. Hold on. Uh, I some people call it dead air. I call it anticipatory air. So when some <laughs> when someone says something and I want to take a second to synthesize what you've said, I'm kind of going, okay, let me think before I open my mouth. And you know what what is that thing? You know, better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and prove it. Uh, so so let me let me ask you. You're you're out for changing the conversation with the book and with the and with the work that you're doing. So short of, okay, I'm gonna go buy the book and I'm gonna look to see what some of those steps might be. How do you get started? Let's say you are someone who wants to do this local energy, uh, embark on it as an entrepreneur. How would someone begin? What are the steps? Well, you you look at the the big trends that are happening and uh, you know it wasn't too long ago that the, U.S. government passed a giant law, which no one thought they would do. Uh, at least a lot of people were skeptical. And it's taken an, a, a trend that was already white hot and basically put it into overdrive, which is the the business opportunities for the transition to clean energy, particularly solar and battery, are just enormous. So start looking around uh, as an entrepreneur, as an innovator, uh, how, how can you improve uh, this rapid rate towards solar and battery? How can you improve uh, the rapid transition towards electric vehicles? Uh, how can you improve the transition towards uh, adoption of energy efficient appliances and LED bulbs? Uh, and, and the great news is now, really for the first time in, in 100 years, you can do it by sitting down around your kitchen table with your friends and thinking about, well, here's something we can do. And here's something we can do is instead of just writing letters to your senators. And and that's what's different here. So as entrepreneurs, you can look at the you can look at um, four different models that I describe in the book. I call them the f the four actually the five orders framework. Uh, if you're science minded, you look at the first order. You look at how do I get involved with making better solar cells and panels? How do I get involved with better batteries, better motors, better LED bulbs? Those are called components in their first order. That's not for everybody because I don't have a PhD and 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 most of us don't. But there's some amazing opportunities. The second order is really cool, and it's one that's generally uh, overlooked by people because it doesn't feel as sexy, but it's taking existing pieces, components, and putting them together into a new product. Mm -hmm. And people are like, eh, you know, that doesn't sound very exciting. Anyone can assemble something. And then I, let, I remind them in the book that uh, you know, when an, uh, Elon Musk and team decided to make a new electric car, uh, they didn't invent a battery. They actually bought existing batteries that were used for laptops. Uh, they they didn't invent uh, transistors and all the things that put it together. But when Elon Musk and team made the first breakthrough electric car, they had the same access that BMW, Ford, General Motors. They had the exact same set of products available to them, exact same set of technologies. But they they were a perfect example of why the second order innovation for entrepreneurs and innovators is so powerful because they put the the components that were available to everybody. In the entire industry, they put them together in a way that no one had ever done before, and they absolutely changed the world. Uh, and that's that's so I always point entrepreneurs towards just put things together in a way that no one else has done. It's much more competitive and innovative than you might think initially. And the third order is uh, when you take a set of assets and you turn them into a service. Best example is uh, you know off grid or solar, where you go and build solar for someone, and rather than having them just pay you to put it on their roof or on their church or their building or their city, uh, they and then then they own it. You actually collect money from them and they pay you by the kilowatt hour. You essentially become a utility, and uh, that's a uh, it's a great model uh, that's doesn't have any relevance in traditional software tech stuff. Um, I, I actually, you could argue software as a service fits that, but but in asset businesses like energy, it's a huge. And then the fourth I'll wrap up is um, uh, platforms. So my favorite example of a platform company is Uber and Lyft, right? They they don't they don't own the cars. They don't even employ the drivers contentiously. Uh, they just use other people's cars, and they have an app that connects all the dots. And you and I and others 
have been all over, the, you know, have traveled all over and, and many people choose to use Uber to, uh, to connect the dots between wherever they're standing and wherever they want to go in some third party that owns a car and can drive it for you. And that disrupted the entire taxi industry uh, just with a little app. And so when you create that platform where people with assets come to, then you've got a new, an entirely new, super sexy venture capital catnip kind of business. And in, in this energy space, you're looking at, for example, um, a vehicle to the grid. You know, everyone's talking about the Ford 150 Lightning, the new electric truck from Ford. Well, their commercials will remind you that you can plug that thing into your house and it becomes a backup generator. We could also send that electricity back to the grid and the utility would pay a fortune for it. Uh, you can use it to share with your neighbor if they're, you know, if the grid's down and they need a boost. I mean, there's so many things you can monetize that, 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 that vehicle uh, electricity with. And that's just a teeny example of the kind of platform opportunities that are emerging. So that it's a long answer, but this four order framework I've created, and I call it five orders because there's a fifth one we can talk about later, but um, it creates all this this this, this, this um, lens through which entrepreneurs can think about what it excites them most. Hmm. I it's so interesting to hear you talk about this. The things that I was thinking about were that we that you can keep doing that, that that it, it is iterative because, for example, we can talk Elon Musk and Tesla, but then several of the engineers from Tesla went and formed Lucid, right? And some of the people who were working for Lyft and Uber ended up forming Turo. And Lucid is a different kind of, it's a, it's another electric car. It's got some of the best things about Tesla and then a bunch of improvements. And Turo, people can actually use, rent out their own cars to somebody who wants to have a car and and use it when they're traveling or whatever. So there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, iterations or there are a lot of iterations that people can do if you have that mindset that says, what can I build off of and and how can I do this? And so when when we're when we're talking about those kinds of platforms, that's one thing. But again, I come back to energy is something that is, you know, if, if we're talking about parts of uh, part of sort of the developing world, they don't even have any sort of electricity, any sort of energy. And so how do we make it equitable all over the, how would we do that during in, in the developing world as well as the developed world when it comes to some of these entrepreneurial ways of doing things, but also providing that energy? I'm really glad you asked that. It doesn't come up often enough. And the reason that local energy is so exciting to me is the, the building blocks, let's call them Lego pieces, Lego bricks, that you use to power a giant city in the United States, solar cells, battery cells, electronics. Those are the exact same components that we're gonna use on a very small scale to provide light and phone charging, radio flashlight for a family in a hut in rural Africa that's never had electricity before. Mm -hmm. So never, Never in energy history has there been a components uh, solution. Never before has it been something you can scale downwards. The whole history of energy has been we need to make ever larger uh, oil refineries, ever larger nuclear power plants, ever larger coal plants, ever larger transmission grids. And, and you do that because it creates economies of scale. And as most of your listeners surely know, that means that the more you, the bigger you make it, the cheaper each each output becomes. And, and that applies to every form of energy except for solar and batteries. And that's why when we think about helping, uh, according to uh, the EIA over in Europe, there's 770 million people in Africa and other parts of, uh, and parts of Asia that have zero electricity, none at all. And uh, there's approximately 1.8 billion people that have either no electricity or its electricity is unaffordable or unreliable to the point that they can't build their lives around it. And that, let's call it 2 billion people of the 7 billion of us, uh, the change that occurs in their life with a simple guarantee that you'll have light at night, the simple guarantee that you can charge your phone without sending your wife or your child on a four mile trek, um, a simple guarantee that that you, that you can have light so your children can study after dark that won't burn your house down that won't take half of your income which is because they otherwise use kerosene and and this is this is triggering a degree of economic development and 
uh, rural and low income parts of the world uh, that we really haven't seen in 100 years since we frankly did the same thing in the United States. Uh, when we 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 went to the other half of the country in the 1930s, it didn't have any electricity, and FDR passed the Rural Electrification Act, which essentially built out the infrastructure. There was no small scale systems then, so the only choice that was to build these giant transmission towers and giant uh, power plants, and it worked. And the United States rose to become one of the most prominent economies in the world. But we have more options when it comes to Africa and rural India. Uh, and the coolest part is older is that that we're not just providing, we're not helping them. The coolest part is that we're giving them the means to reinvent themselves, their economies, and to give birth to a new generation of entrepreneurs uh, that didn't exist before. You know, I have a, I have a podcast uh, called Free Energy as well. And I just interviewed uh, uh, the founders of a company called Sun King. And they have raised, drum roll, 260 million dollars which is wow. on top of a hundred million before that exclusively to bring these uh solar lanterns and low-end solar home systems to people that can barely afford it who and they include the technology for these people to, to pay for it one day at a time as they're able to as they're able to afford it and they have create they have two thousand employees at sun king and more importantly they have fifteen thousand people who uh, who deliver these products in the fields, uh, in the in the in the communities of some of the poorest places on earth, and are creating jobs for these people. So that's when when I knew I had to do local energy. It's when I realized that we're not just going to save the planet; we're going to provide jobs, uh, economic development, and change the lives of two billion people. That's when I knew uh, that I this was what I had to do, and no one else saw the connection between all this, and that's one of the reasons I decided to throw away a very good career in marketing tech and uh, get into um, uh, being a book author. Yay! <laughs> that no, that's it's so fantastic. It's it reminds me uh, some of Little Sun. I don't know if you know what those are. They're little solar uh, powered lights that look like a little sunflower and when you buy one for example one gets sent as part of a, a project to places in say the developing world that don't have access to electricity and you charge it and it gives you something like 25 hours of light or something like that and it's a powerful little led and there was one holiday where i bought everyone i knew <laughs> little sun so that a whole bunch would be sent over and what's interesting is um, there's the, the man who sort of founded it, Olafur Eliasson, he said, bringing solar energy to everyone is simple. It starts with you. Let's take the power of the future into our own hands. That was that's a direct like quote it. from him. And so when when we talk about this, when you're talking about people who have that entrepreneurial mindset and who want to do these things like the people at Sun King, like the people that you're you're working with and, and you know, Eliasson with with little son we're talking about something that is in many ways revolutionary for these parts of the world that are traditionally underrepresented and underrecognized this is going to be a weird question but what kind of social uh or 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 public relations work and maybe even psychological work is being done to prepare people that this is something that's coming and that they can be part of it well, when I was talking to uh, Anish and Patrick of Sun King, they said that of the of the the vast majority of that fifteen thousand people that are now out there representing their product and delivering it and supporting it for these vast communities, uh, they almost all of them started as customers. Mm. And so this has a you know I grew up in the age of Tupperware where uh, someone would come into your home and say I bought Tupperware I really like it would you like to buy some and it's you know, multi level marketing which is uh, can go askew, but as a general, uh, I love this product. Would you like to buy it as well? Is a powerful viral way to share sure. uh, the benefits, and that's essentially what's driving uh, so many of the companies. Probably uh, Solar Flower and and B Box and D, D Light and M Copa and of course Sun King. It's all this uh, viral word of mouth. And these products are affordable and they're small. They can be delivered. Really, the bigger resistance isn't consumer perception. Uh, it's it's the the governments of uh, some of these countries and concerns by capital sources, which are almost always outside of those countries, uh, to make bets in those countries. Mm. So you've got sort of getting the money 
in and out of the countries. Uh, while it's it's all the places this that are being sold is it's it's safe and legal, but it's complicated. It requires expertise. You have currency fluctuations you don't see. You have uh, if I'm going to loan money to Sun King so that they can uh, buy and license these products one day at a time to their customers. But what happens if there's a a currency fluctuation and, and I'm in the US and I loan money to these guys and I might, I, I, the company can make money, but I get paid back very little because the, the currency spikes. Uh, the, so there's a lot of issues and the governments themselves, um, you know, they struggle with what to do with these products because and there's so many stories around this in my book, but I sat down with the CEO and I went to visit Africa a few times. And I sat down with the CEO of one of the, um, Utility, electric utilities that one of the uh, more progressive countries in Africa. <clears throat> and I said to him, how much does it cost you? You know, but two thirds of your population is not on the grid. How much does it cost you to pull the grid to these remote people? And he said, roughly on average, about 1500 US dollars. I said, okay, mm-hmm. how much would it cost you to provide them a solar home system that can power four or five lights that gives them a television, a radio, a phone charger, uh, et cetera. And he goes $250. And I just looked at him and he kind of looked at me and he says, you don't get it. He said, of course, we should just be providing solar home systems for everybody. He said, but we're a, we're, we're a poor country. We don't have the ability to just snap our fingers. We rely deeply on the world bank and us aid and other debt and uh, support organizations. And we say to them, we want to electrify our population. Their answer is, uh, build a grid build a giant power plant because that's what they've done in every other country for 50 years. Right. And so we, he said, part of the work you're doing and the reason we're excited to meet you and the people that are doing what you're doing is you're re-educating everybody that we don't need to build a coal power plant or a natural gas plant to, to, to power my country. There's better, cheaper, faster ways. Uh, it'll take me 10 years at the current rate to uh, bring the grid to everyone in my country. I could have everyone with a solar um, home system within two years. And that country went and made some big changes in policy and the adoption rate of the small local energy systems just absolutely took off. Uh, Not because I met with them, but I think a lot of people were telling them the same thing and they made some policy changes and it worked. So the the biggest challenge is just having these governments and the people who would provide money through and into those countries to realize that this is, uh, uh, this is, there is a better way. The old, the thing that you, your grandfather did and your grandmother did you can do much better than that now. And just that's the mindset that needs to change. Okay, so how? That becomes the question that's on my mind. How do we change? You know, I mean, I worked for the government. I worked for NASA for many years. It is a behemoth, right? You you don't get to change things at NASA quickly. You don't get to change things in governments quickly. The, that's why the bureaucracies are there, I think, is to impede progress. That's just my own personal, I will step off my soapbox. But, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but seriously, though, there is, you know, I, 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 as someone who worked at NASA for, for so long, and as someone who often felt like I was really beating my head against the wall, if you want to do this, and you know, you're talking about doing this stuff from the outside in, right? They're not part part of the system as it as it stands right now for the most part these new entrepreneurs who want to get into this they have to do it from the outside and then how 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 does that happen what are the what are the things that a new entrepreneur who wants to work in this space might have to do in a country where they need it obviously but they don't have a, a an infrastructure to to work with it well, five years ago, it was absolutely pioneering. And today, in most countries around the world, it's now seen as a very good idea. And people are receptive. Uh, there are still places. Uh, I'm going to have a guest on my podcast in a, uh, in a little while named Jacqueline Novogratz, who's the CEO of a, was I think, considered the most well-respected, earliest visionary uh, social impact fund. And her fund acumen had basically provided the initial capital to a lot of these early off-grid solar home systems, uh, MCOPA, D-Light, D-Box, so this, the, the who's who of that industry uh, were all funded by Acumen. And 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 now the industry's taken off, to your point, Isilda. So now the Sun King, for example, raised money from a big private equity firm in, in New York. So 
that bridge has been built. Uh, the governments that Sun King and all these other companies are selling to now accept it. So what I can, so what Jacqueline is doing, and the reason I'm going to have her as a guest is she is going to go back down deep and 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 find the rest of the people that are unserved because there's still a lot of governments mm -hmm. um, that are even poorer than mm -hmm. East Africa and are even more difficult to drive change. And she's got a brilliant plan, uh, a mix of money and com connections and communications to take those ideas and the patterns that are working in many countries in Africa and also like India and places and make it easy, easy, easy for the governments and entrepreneurs and buyers of some countries that are today very underserved still uh, to, to follow in the footsteps. So I got to tell you, the, the hard work is, the, the, the spade work has been done. This is it now works. The business model for off-grid solar is and, and batteries and um, uh, systems to, to to grind up feed and all this all this whole electric ecosystem, a local energy ecosystem has been proven. So now it just takes people to uh, carry the proven ideas into new markets. But uh, you know, you you talk about convincing governments. I got to tell you, the. This, even here in the U.S., the story is just as bifurcated and, mm. you know, cheer one day and pull your hair out the next. I mean, two quick data points to show you that if you're an entrepreneur who's who's interested in working in the, the wealthier parts of the world, like where you and I live or Europe, um, you, you know, on one hand, the U.S. federal government passed a big law called the inf uh, inflammation, uh, inflammation. <laughs> uh, the IRA, and it, uh, yeah, inflammation is good, um, the Inflation Reduction Act. And this is a, uh, just a 30 years in coming, certainly imperfect, but this is a really major watershed event for the government supporting the transition in clean energy. But on the other hand, Here's a statistic that'll blow your mind. If you go and build, you and I want to put solar on our roof. It's pretty consistent across the United States. We're gonna we're gonna hire a local firm. They're gonna put it up on our roof. They're gonna send us a bill. You're gonna pay about three dollars a watt, fairly consistently across the U.S. That means if you put up a four K, a four thousand watt system, a four K system, which is about average in the United States, uh, you're gonna pay about twelve thousand dollars. Here's the crazy part about how bureaucratic the U.S. is. If you take that same solar panel and you buy it in Australia, the same inverter, you send people on, the, on a roof in Australia, same kind of roof, and they go on the roof and they do the nails and the screws and they're finished, uh, you're going to pay for that same hardware and labor in Australia. You're going to pay $1.10 in US dollars. For $3 for an American installation, same components, same people, same hardware, $1.10 in US dollars in Australia. The difference is what the industry calls soft costs. And you and I can think of soft costs as bureaucracy, red mm. tape. I could mm. tell you stories that would make you pull your <laughs> hair out about how silly it is to do this in the U.S. And so this is a fantastic opportunity for entrepreneurs right here at home is just to work within your community to streamline that process. And there's so many ways to do it. There's so many ways that entrepreneurs, advocates, innovators, school teachers, doctors, anybody can sort of get involved and you can start businesses. Uh, you can great, grow great businesses just streamlining from that $3 a watt here in the US to $1.10 for the same parts in, in Australia. There's so many ways to make that happen faster. So it's not just this big stuff in, Aust uh, in uh, Africa, which I personally sound like you're so excited about, but even here at home, you know, think about a, uh, a, a, a low income community Mm. Uh, that's, uh, that, uh, that doesn't get the taxes that it should get. The schools are underfunded. The police department's not there, but imagine, and then they, maybe they live in California or in Louisiana or Texas where outages are an increasing problem, right? And the power goes out for three days and the last community to get power back on again is this poor one that people are forgetting about. Well, more and more you're seeing those communities through help of outsiders and the government's getting very, the federal government's getting very supportive. Let's build a solar battery system. We'll keep that community's health center, that community's police department running, that community school running 24 seven, no matter what the grid does. And by the way, they own that system so that they, they can erase from their, uh, their, their expenses, uh, the cost of electricity because it goes to close to zero because they've now generated all their own energy locally. So I always like to, I, I love the idea that this local energy can transform people in Africa, uh, in the US, 
can make people billionaires. It can help the poorest people, no matter where they live, improve their lives. It is the most, it is the single best universal solution to so many ills in the world that I've ever found. And I'm so excited uh, to be a part of what we call the local energy revolution. And mic drop. Wow. All right. Uh, Bill, that I, I think I think that is a really good place to end this end this discussion. I have many more questions and I'd love it if you'd come back at some point and talk about the difference between microgrids and mini grids and what that means for local communities, because there's there's so much here that people who don't have access can do to get access. Yet at the same time, one of the things that I think is so amazing is I read on a bumper sticker once that said, you know, a solar energy spill just means you've had a really nice day. It's, <laughs> you know, I, isn't that great? And and to me, I'm like, yeah, this is important. This is safe. That's the thing that I love about this, what, we, what we're calling clean energy. It's safe. It is safe, right? And And as someone who likes her life and wants to keep it, that's very important to me. Yet, um, I, I again, I, Bill, honestly, I, I could keep you here for like the next seven hours and we could be talking and talking and talking, but I know you have a life to get back to. I, I would, I'm would. i super grateful that you took the time to chat with me. I did want to ask you one question that I ask everybody who comes on the show, and it's a silly little question, but I find that it yields some profound results. So I'm going to ask you that question in a second, but I would love it first. If somebody wants to know more about the book, if somebody wants to know more about how to connect with you, would you mind giving like your socials and where someone could find Freeing Energy, the book? Absolutely. The book's available everywhere. So Freeing Energy, Freeing Energy. Uh, people think it's free energy, which by the way, there is some of that, but the title is Freeing Energy. And uh, the easiest place to start is freeingenergy.com. Uh, no spaces. And from there, you can learn about our podcast, which I'm very proud to say have been ranked the number one renewable energy podcast in the country. Uh, you can read nice. all the articles. Uh, the, the book itself, you can learn about the book, but the book itself has 400 citations. It's I don't know that there's another book like it because it really wants to, it, the, my goal is to help people that are skeptical they want to build a business case or make a case to their local legislators. So all the points in, that are made in the book are actually sourced back to the website with the spreadsheets that you can actually go on the website and play around with the numbers and see what you think the outcomes could be by changing the numbers. So all that's on freeingenergy.com. And uh, the book's available everywhere and the podcast is available everywhere. Awesome. All right. Well, all of that will be in the show notes too, just so you know, if you're listening to this, I know people, ooh, hold on. Ooh, my voice went for a second there. Uh, I know people learn differently, so I like it when, it, you know, thank you for saying it because some people learn hearing it, some people learn seeing it. And now we get to the question. Uh, the question, as I said, is a silly one, but here it is. And it is this. If you had an airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? That is an awesome question. You know, we were leading. I was really nervous. Uh, uh, so uh, it's like, what has she learned about me that I shouldn't have done? Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I ask this of every single person who comes on the show. So it's it's not personal. It's just your own perspective on what if you had an airplane that was environmentally friendly, of course, that could scar at anything for the whole world to see. What would you say? Well, the author and the, you know, I would put something like the local energy revolution uh, because it'd be provocative. But honestly, I think I'd go deeper than that uh, in the spirit of the question you're asking. I would probably say, uh, think bigger than yourself. Oh, I like it. That's a great one. What a great one. Thank you so much for that. That's terrific. Bill, again, thank you for being on the show. And I know you're going to come right back and we're going to do the little bonus episode where we get some of your favorites. Uh, is there anything else that you feel like you didn't get to say that you wanted to make sure that you said? I just want to reiterate that uh, the book is dedicated in the opening, that little dedication section. It's to the 10,000 people that haven't yet joined the industry that are going to welcome them to come into the industry, to change their careers, to get into one of the most exciting, impactful, and positive opportunities in the history of our generation, and uh, to welcome aboard. And if this interests you, if anyone's listening in and this is interesting to them, my book is just one of hundreds of great resources, and the world needs you. Uh, the world needs people to jump in and be pioneers and help us uh, 
make the place the world much better for our children, grandchildren, and generations to come. So welcome aboard. Come on in. Awesome. The water's fine, as they say. And I, again, thank you, Bill, for joining me. You're going to come right back to do the bonus episode of your recommendations on various things. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset Podcast, reminding you my latest book is out. You can find it. There's a little link to it on the show notes page as well. Die by the Sword is out and be uh, Get Booked is coming out in September. There's all sorts of stuff. So by the time this episode airs, Get Booked is out. So yay, lots of stuff going on. If you want to get in touch with me, you know how to do it. You can contact me. Until next time, I am Isolde Trachtenberg again for the Innovative Mindset Podcast, reminding you to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2022. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, remember to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind.